And here we are, we are Knife Merchant with this Master Knife Service Gentleman. Uh, that's not even a title, I don't think, but... It sounds pretty cool. Yeah, right? Well, this is Bill. Bill, tell us about yourself a little bit. And Hi, my name is Bill. Uh, I'm here with Knife Merchant and uh, do all the knife sharpening uh, here. And I'm excited to get this off the ground and be able to offer uh, finer edges to our customers, our more demanding customers. Uh, we have, uh, you know, such a wide selection of Japanese cutlery and I want to bring out the maximum potential of all of these knives and all the steels. Uh, you know, uh, factory finishes are, of course, excellent, but in some cases can be improved, and I want to do that for people. Uh, we also resharpen knives, that even if they're not purchased here, and I do more than just sharpening. Uh, I notice a lot of services will either not do hand sharpening or they will have knives that are bent and they don't straighten them. I think it's very critical to straighten a knife and keep your stones flat because without the two surfaces being flat, they're not gonna make contact with one another properly. Mm -hmm. And um, I have some examples of problems that I see and really like to fix is a recurvature or there's a high spot in the edge of the blade. I will Hopefully the light will shine through. You can see, if you look really closely, there is a little bit of a low spot right here. I'll focus on this. Okay. Where the blade comes up. I don't know if you can see the light. Oh yeah, shine see that. Right Definitely see that. Uh -huh. The, uh... How did that happen? That's from uh, using a rod all the time and not really yeah. using a stone? It can be uh, from using a, st uh, a stone in just one spot. You can use uh, a really coarse sharpening rod, right? And if you don't start at the base, and you just start somewhere right here, it'll wear away. Or just really <laughs> extreme usage, you know, uh, blades wear away; they don't last forever, and sometimes that has to be reflattened. If it doesn't make contact with the cutting board, especially if you have, you know, a more uh, Japanese style of cut rather than like a rocking motion, mm -hmm. uh, it won't make contact with the board and knife is essentially useless it'll feel sharp to the touch and people will come to me and say hey my knife it feels sharp but it doesn't work and uh it's usually very subtle and i can show them you know you can look along the edge and sometimes you can see it but sometimes you need like a ruler or a flat surface to really show uh that problem where did this knife come from uh actually uh this was given to me uh by a customer they said here uh, I don't want this knife anymore because <laughs> it doesn't work. Right. And so uh, I just uh, had it in my pile of many knives. Uh, this, of course, can be, uh, you know, refinished to a new knife. Uh, it's kind of level, you know, almost brand new. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I really pride myself in doing is when you have a low spot like that, and uh, it you take it to a professional knife sharpening service, many times they will remove the heel. This is called the heel portion of the knife and it's easier for most, most sharpeners to just remove this portion of the knife in order to bring this surface flat. Right. Instead, I remove all of the part in front of it on the blade in order to preserve this height because especially when you have a larger hand like mine uh, this cl clearance of the cutting board is very important. Oh, that's very true. And also, uh, aesthetically, if you remove this part of the knife, people notice right away. As soon as you bring it back to them, they go, hey, what happened to my knife? And, I bet uh, you most people won't even realize what they did either. Just, oh, it's a straight edge now, so I guess it's okay. Yeah. So, uh, we take uh, great pride in preserving the original geometry and hopefully balance of the knife. Uh, without altering it too much from its original state. Uh, even if we have knives in their original state, like uh, we were doing yesterday, like this Ninox, the factory edge, although it's designed for strength, for some people's uh, preference, it's a little bit, it's not as uh, acute as they would like. And so we'll sharpen it, and so it'll nice ha have a nice smooth taper all the way to the edge, and that'll give you a lot less pressure when you're cutting. It gives it that feel almost like it's drawing into the cutting material. And uh, something that 
some people don't have the time to do. It takes a long time to uh, re-bevel a knife by hand, so. On average, how long does it take you to just to re-bevel an edge? Uh, I can do it probably in a half an hour, uh, but if they want like full face sharpening or they want what they call a zero grind, some people call it, uh, yeah, that can take an hour to do by hand. Right. Uh, it just takes the right equipment, and a lot of people don't have the money to invest in you know, a whole set of very expensive stones, and that's where we come in. And not even that, just the skill and the experience. Because half an hour you could be, could take two hours from somebody else, and they still can get it right, so. Yeah, that's true. Hey, you know what, you want it done right, you gotta do, give it to the right person. Yeah, uh, we're, uh, we're more than happy to uh, accommodate anyone's needs. Uh, I understand that there are many people out there that sharpen their knives very well. Right. Many cooks, many chefs. Uh, sometimes they do encounter a little bit of a problem, and. Hey, you know, send it to us. I'm more than happy to help. That's great. Uh, a lot of times uh, you get a Japanese style knife where it has, uh, you know, a one side, only one side is sharpened. The other side has a slight concave and then flatness. Many times people that sharpen their own knives and very well uh, will get uh, a bit of a convex edge and they would like this bevel face reflattened. And especially with something like a Deba, that can take a very long time. Mm. And in some t in some cases, it does take uh, you know a powered equipment to uh, to get it really flattened again. But then it's always finished by hand. Uh, yeah, you know, a chisel ground edge. Uh, since it has such a wide bevel face, it takes right. a very long time to do by hand. Also, uh, the heels of knives are, and the bolsters uh, can extend out further than the rest of the blade surface. And again, it won't meet flat with the cutting board. And that just comes with, you know, normal usage. And so we will remove a bit of the heel so the knife uh, functions properly again. Uh, also, we can do, you know, cosmetic polishing just so the knife appears as though it is uh, brand new. Like yesterday, uh, I had resharpened the edge of this Ninox knife, but in the process of sharpening by hand, you will get scratch patterns that go far up above the actual bevel. Sure. And uh, you can do it by hand pretty easily. <laughs> David really liked this one. Uh, you just clamp it down to the table. It's nothing fancy at all. And you can use a stick with some foam on it and some automotive sandpaper. What grade is that? This is paper? 500. Okay. Uh, I like to go a little bit lower than the stone we started with, which is a 1000, uh, to make sure that you fully remove the scratches. Uh, removing, uh, you know, getting a nice finish uh, on the knife requires quite a bit of work, and you have to start a little bit lower than the grit you were sharpening with in order to remove all those scratches. But you can do it quite simply by hand if you have the time. A lot of knife makers call this a pulled satin finish. And, and that piece of tape just covers out the brand name of the knife? Yeah, because you know, we're just doing this for appearances. Sure. And you can remove the uh, Let's kind of go down there and take a look the at factory this. bevel line so it has a nice smooth taper all the way to the edge. And this, is, this knife is a very thick knife. It's intended for heavy use, so I don't want to make the edge too thin. But to remove the factory bevel, is something that many of our customers desire and I am more than happy to do. And you simply... I don't know anyone else, have, else out there offering this type of service. Uh, you know, custom knife makers do this. Yeah. But you then guys... you uh, work your way up to a thousand. Most uh, Industrial abrasives are not available above a thousand grit, but you can buy automotive sandpaper up to two thousand, I think, or three thousand maybe. We have five thousand. We have five thousand. Mm, Excellent. Nice. Didn't know that. <laughs> Good to know. And the part that's above that piece of tape, what do you do there? You just leave that. Oh no, I can keep. You know, I can do the whole section okay. of the knife. Absolutely. Kind of get that right in the bolster. We also have uh, non-woven abrasives, which is it's like a 3M Scotch-Brite pad, and it'll very accurately 
uh, recreate a real factory finish. But you can see this is a thousand grit and you can still see some scratches that are still left there. So right. that part, that's part of the uh, complicated uh, mirror finishes. That's what makes it complicated is that you do have to start at a really high grit, possibly higher than what you might think in order to remove the hand sharpening scratches. piece of sandpaper <laughs> mm -hmm. you can see them starting to fade yeah and it just takes a little bit of time I mean, just look at the steel that's coming off the, from the sandpaper the edge of the front of the knife yeah absolutely. you see that's working it already see as you can see it already looks better yeah but just take a little bit of time to get those really nice finishes. That's beautiful. And then, uh, you know, take a little cleaning cloth. Some, uh, where is the uh, powder? Shun, uh, we sell a little Shun kit. It's very official. What is that now? What do you, what do you? Uh, it's a polishing powder. Okay. That helps to remove oils from uh, non stain resistant knives. Okay. Let's see, it cleans up the surface of a knife quite well. And that's just a few minutes. I mean, <laughs> we can wow. keep going. We can do a whole mirror finish on the knife. And uh, I think you're going to inundate it with calls now. Huh? I think you're going to get inundated with calls. People are going to send you, send you your knives. They're nice to you. Sure, that'd be cool. <laughs> <laughs> send them in. Uh, you go back and just go back to like uh, 8,000 grit. And it'll, you know, get that nice mirror edge and still have the factory finish without any of the really deep scratches. Sure. So it'll have the appearance of a new knife, but it'll have the performance of a knife. Which, uh, best of both worlds. Yep, right best there. of both. Yeah, and uh, the uh, Shun Polishing Kit is also really good for, let's see, this is Masahiro. If it's not stain resistant, uh, you can use some of that. Or you can use a scouring compound like Barkeeper's Friend and physically abrade the surface to remove rust that has gotten on your knife. Okay. Uh, however, like you saw that really old Henkel's knife, uh, rust is actually its own worst enemy. <laughs> so you let the knife patina a little bit and leave it that way. If you constantly try to remove the patina, it will just come back. It happens when you cut anything that has any sort of acidic quality to it. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can also force patinas. If people uh, want to purchase a non-stain resistant knife and they want a special patina, we can do that too. <laughs> nice. uh, you can pattern it with, uh, you can even use mustard. <laughs> you can put patterns on the knife and give it like a cool look to it. So all kinds of cool customization things. Not just sharpening or right. repairs. Uh, also, yeah, chipping. Uh, if you have a knife that is chipped or the tip is just bent and not broken off, I do not want to remove any more metal than I absolutely have to. And so I will straighten the knife out. And if possible, if the edge is just deflected and not actually chipped away from the blade, then usually I can hammer some of the metal behind the edge and bring it back out and then resharpen the knife without losing any of your edge. Okay. Which is really important for me because these knives, they're made to last a lifetime and they easily can. Uh, if you uh, grind away too much, you lose years on the, on the life of the knife. Sure. And it uh, breaks my heart. <laughs> <laughs> knives are precious to us. How long have you been doing this for? Uh, I've been hand sharpening since I was a little kid. Okay. Uh, but professionally, uh, it's been about over three years now. Okay. Yeah. Nice. 
this uh, service here at Knife Merchant. Me and David have just teamed up and uh, it's kind of in its infancy. But uh, maybe we'll make some YouTube videos with uh, some uh, better magnification so we can mm -hmm. actually show the performance of the stones that we offer and also in relation to the different steels and knives that we offer because uh, it's important to use different kinds of steel on uh, different stones in order to truly judge their performance. Right. We don't sell any products that we don't stand behind. We use all of the products here <laughs> uh, every day. So uh, anything that you will get from us is gonna be a quality product, including the sharpening surf. And then yesterday we talked about the stropping and all that. Um, oh yeah. Stropping. Let's actually, uh, let's show, the, let's show our fans out there what you actually did yesterday. Uh, there is a huge uh, world out there that was uh, really started by straight razors for shaving. Uh, where they've been stropping for hundreds of years, I think. And uh, some people might consider it a bit excessive, but I think it's very convenient for daily edge maintenance. Uh, this uh, a Mercer MX3 that I resharpen and I use myself uh, every day. And I've only been stropping it for the past six months. And uh, let me get a piece of paper to demonstrate. I have not stropped this, so I'm hoping that it doesn't cut through the paper, so I can strop, <laughs> strop it and show you. Yeah, but it's still cutting oh, through the paper wow. anyway, so uh, let me find some thinner did paper. You, did everyone just see that? <laughs> it looks really thin and flimsy. This is not butcher paper. This is thin packing paper. You know, know, there's a lot of videos out there that people, you know, they take a piece of paper, they hold it with one hand, and then they take the knife in the other hand. And just kind of just pull it down, but you know what? The, the hand's actually holding the piece of paper, so there's some some kind of resistance, you know? Yeah. You just put that paper, fold it in half, and just put the thing right down. I mean, this that was the, uh, crazy. This is the new standard, I think. Uh, a lot of knife knife makers will use this to demonstrate the sharpness. Yeah, the sharpness of their knives. Yeah, this is uh, this is not even butcher paper, like you said. This is like almost like. Uh, almost like tissue, just one one level above tissue paper that you use for like a deli, like a, you know, like a deli paper. Kind right. Of thing. Um, yeah, the other one, uh, if you roll it up, it also works really well. Too. Right, let me get a good angle so I can show all the fans out there what you just did. The but won't even it's stand just because it's so flimsy. Uh, I almost want to dull it a little bit to show you. I want to show the effects of dropping without magnification. See, this is so thin it won't even stand up on its own. Hmm. There we go. Okay, hold on. Oh, see? Good. No, this is good though. Okay. See, it wasn't able to do it. Now, I'll strop this knife, and I'm almost certain that it will uh, come right back. Uh, this is uh, green. It's a pretty fine compound. And this is basically what you mentioned yesterday is a piece of wood uh, with leather on it that you can pick up anywhere, even on Amazon. Uh, you just glue it down real, real strong, some good quality glue, and just put something very heavy on top so it's flat. Yeah, uh, I'm not really sure if <laughs> this is for everyone, so we haven't really like made any for sale here. So yeah, uh, maybe perhaps in the future. So you just rubbing, you just bring up the knife, both sides up yeah. the piece of leather. You can use a lot of pressure too, and the leather will contour to the shape that you have already sharpened into that knife and uh, will slightly convex the edge, give it a little bit more strength. Some people believe that if you shrop excessively, it will uh, kind of dull the edge, but that, in my opinion, would take a lot of stropping. Do you have like an angle? Let's see, you're doing it, what angle is that, do you think? Oh, uh, that's the other cool thing about stropping is you can uh, Whatever, change very... the angle and okay. it's gonna be very uh, forgiving, I would say. So it doesn't have to be perfect because you yeah. just got some pressure on that edge anyway. Even with enough pressure, you can put it on the side of the knife and use these to polish the sides. And uh, even though it's considered just for appearances, um, polishing the side of a knife, theoretically, the uh, smoother the side of the knife is, the less friction you'll create while cutting. Um, 
I've noticed with a very sharp knife, you will see the gloss of the meat or even vegetables uh, that you cut and uh, helps to preserve the flavor. And this is a finer compound. And what's the compound that you put on it? What's it called? Uh, it's, uh, they, they're classified in colors. Uh, it goes black, uh, reddish brown, green, white, and then blue. Blue is usually intended for plastics. I find it doesn't take to a strop very well. Okay. It does work for powered buffing wheels, but whenever possible, I like to finish knives by hand. So not to affect the heat treatment of the knives. When, uh, even with buffing, not just mechanically grinding knives, uh, you can overheat the edge and change the heat treatment and it will soften the steel. Okay. Even when I do grind a knife, um, I will resharpen the edge by hand so as to remove any potentially softened steel. All my equipment's water cooled though, so the likelihood of that happening is pretty small. All right, okay. same piece of paper. All right. Should work this time. Moment of truth. Yeah, moment of truth, huh? <laughs> Let's get it to stand up again. I'll see, you did a little bit of a cut. Yeah, I cut a little bit, but not all the way. Oop. Oh, man. Well, we know the paper's thin, at least. Oh. It's dropping. Incredible. Yeah. All right, I like to see the challenge out there. How many other people can do this? <laughs> the, uh, the paper roll is a good one, too. That was incredible. Let me get uh, one of these. Yeah, give me some tape, please. Um, that is, of course, that's a blade meeting with a flat edge of paper. Uh, I think it's more difficult to pierce a rolled piece of paper, a rounded edge. So that's that's my uh, definition of sharpness usually. Everyone has their own standards. I mean, yeah. Bottom line, uh, whatever works for you. You know, this is just what I do. These are my opinions and beliefs. Ooh, that looks that's really loose. That should be hard to cut. Yeah. There it is. There we go. There's yeah. the proof. There's the evidence. <laughs> wow. Yeah, shaving with hairs is just one standard. That you know, that's yeah, pretty that's. Good one. And um, unfortunately, I can't really show you really up close, but this edge is more like it's more like this rather than this. Uh, it's very convex at the edge, very strong, but it's still obviously quite sharp. Yeah, it's very, very sharp. Yeah, uh, yeah also sometimes, uh, you know, many people, they sharpen their own knives and the edge will back up a little bit and uh, they need this, the side, removing the sides of a bevel is, in my opinion, the hardest part of the whole job of sharpening. And it's something that some people may have trouble with and uh, I am more than happy to help. So send them in. Sounds great. We will bring you back some sharp knives. So you, uh, people could send knives to you as well and Bill would be able to sharpen them for him? They can. We have not really uh, put together a decent program to say here's how much it is to uh, send them in, but we will be doing that. And okay. Yes, this is the uh, Masahiro 3000. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the companion to the uh, 1000. Right produces a very high shine for a 3000 grit, in my opinion. And what did you learn your skill, Bill? <laughs> Just practice. <laughs> practice, practice, practice. Cooking, getting your knives dull, and needing another sharp one. People don't realize, I mean, half the battle is having a sharp knife. Indeed it is. Uh, it's not just cooking, and we have We've had people come through our business that have cooking skill, but then their knives are dull as a you know dull as a butter knife. You kind of wonder, you know, to me that we have somebody 
who is a cook. But there are many knife sharpeners out there. The difficulty in making a living uh, out of knife sharpening is oftentimes they're mobile. Um, they're getting, they're two styles, the guys who are charging $1.50 to $2 for an inch. And oftentimes, you know, somebody who's cooking, that, that's just uh, cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do, Bill is on the payroll here. So when he makes additional money uh, sharpening a knife, it's just bonus. But uh, this way we can take the time to do them properly with stones. Right. The only way for uh, an individual to do this, he has to be able to run them across a, a grinder, a sandpaper belt very quickly and hand it back to you within 15 minutes. It's barely, you can only start to see it just take away the shine of the, uh, the mechanical finish. But uh, you have to just keep going until you get all those heavy scratches out. I can still see it on the very edge. Perhaps uh, a little 1,000 is needed. <laughs> Okay, this is Bill again. I have to say Bill is a master at sharpening knives. <laughs> Thank you. Right, you didn't know I was going to ask you this question. So for our fans out there, how long can you soak one of these Kokuchi stones or Masahiro stones? You can almost soak them permanently. In fact, I think it's better the longer you soak them. Uh, the only ones that I've had trouble with are ceramic stones. Those are the only ones that I wouldn't soak for an extended period of time. Uh, or Norton stones. Norton's have a limited soak time. But the Masahiro stones, you can soak them almost indefinitely. Okay. Don't worry about leaving those guys in overnight. They'll be fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you hear fans out there. Thank you, David, for the time that you've given to us. You know, yeah, we really appreciate right. that. Uh, let's kind of just go around. And anything that you all need on the website, just take a look. Yeah, we're pretty well known for the cutlery, but we sell cookware, whips, Quail egg, scissors, plating, tongs, and tweezers, more abashi, uh, sushi mats, um, anything that you may be looking for in a professional kitchen, we're likely to have it. Right. So. We actually had the pleasure of going to Nobu last night. Thank you again very much for the dinner. Um, but all the chefs in there are using your knives, which is really interesting. Yes, so that was, that was fun. At Nobu, which is, if you don't know what Nobu is, then you need to find out. I really do. <laughs> so... Yeah, we have basically um, set this up in a warehouse district so that we can have uh, the proper pricing level on our knives. Uh, we have the, all of the cooks from the San Diego area that like to come down here and purchase directly. So what we had done is got the largest warehouse space that we had in this complex, uh, which is fairly centrally located and yet not easy to find. Uh, we're <laughs> back behind Miramar Air Base. Uh, but you know there are very few people who do this so it gives us the opportunity to for those guys who are looking for a knife that can come in here and uh, feel it try it make sure that it is the correct knife for them we don't have to pay retail costs and so you know we can pass those savings directly on um, you've seen uh, a bit of our displays out front yesterday but this is what we have hiding in the back just mm -hmm. uh, racks and rows of knives and cookware and product that we turn down here about five times a year. Well, wow, that's wonderful. A lot of you are using Knife Merchant already. If you're not, you have to. And uh, we've got a code in the description box. You get 10% off. All the stuff is well stocked. I don't know a nicer gentleman in this business. I'm not just saying that. So definitely Stop buying. Really, it's for people in the biz too. You know, I mean, there's some people that want to cook for the weekends, and you know, but Absolutely. this is really there for the. A lot of homeowners down here that look at it and say, "Well, give me the professional quality material. Right. You really want it to last a long time. Let's go with what the professionals are using." And it's not the most exorbitant price stuff. Um, you know, these tools have to pay for themselves. So it may seem ex. Expensive. Sometimes you look at these knives down here, three hundred dollars. That there's a reason for that. There are different properties and, and needs for them, and we go down to some fairly inexpensive. Our uh, cheapest lines down here are going to be like Victorinox, uh, Friedrich Dick, Mercer Cutlery makes excellent products. Um, everything down here has uh, a need and a price point for it. And uh, you know, when you get to a certain level down there, as uh, Chef Hero is down here, then you're going to be looking for some premium cutlery but you know for a lot of guys that are starting out and for the households when you're making three meals a day a knife does not have to stand up to the same abuse that it does when sure. you're using it eight to ten hours so. good point but some people have to have the best they don't have to have you know certain brands so yeah, that's always that that yeah, is well out there it's, it's nice to have showy pieces yeah too. exactly I mean, yeah, it is fun to have people come in there and say what the heck is that when i see some of these cutlery sets with just the 
beautiful handles on them and marble right. wood, earl wood handles and stuff. So, and we carry them to all extremes. Sure. All of them meeting one standard, and that's that they have to be of a suitable quality to go into a restaurant and go to work and have that thing last for you for several years. So. Absolutely. Well, thank you again so much for your time. One quick look here. Okay, well, we'll see you very soon. Hopefully next year we'll be here again. Okay, sounds All right. good. Take care. Bye-bye.